Every time we get together, it's so exciting because God makes it life-changing. Thank God. Philippians 4 verse 6 says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, pray about it. Pray about everything. Praise God. That's what we're going to do right now. Precious Heavenly Father, we are in an amazing series on faith, and we need your help, Lord. We need your help to stir up and transfer all the faith, the heavenly faith that we need to live life strong. So help us, God. As we hear the word of God, may faith jump up in our hearts, Lord, and may it motivate our lives. And Lord, may it be activated to move mountains in Jesus' name. Father, we believe we receive it, and we thank you for your help. Amen. Oh my goodness. This is so good. Faith Moves Part 2. And we're going to really dial in on your faith design, specifically your faith design as we talk about faith moves. In Part 1, we learn that Jesus said, faith moves mountains, books and mountains. Let's look at the sequence of Christ's instruction to his disciples in that famous scripture again, Mark 11, starting at verse 22. And Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God constantly. Have faith in God constantly. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Look at that little phrase there, for him. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. I like that. You will get it. So a quick review of what we've learned so far from Jesus on the topic of faith moves. Number one, have faith in God constantly. Look, it's our lifestyle. It's how we live. So Jesus is telling us it's faith in God and it's constant. Number two, talk to the mountain. Think about this. Most people pray about the mountain instead of talking to the mountain or talking to the problem. Number three, give specific instructions. Philippians 4, 6 calls this petitions. That means specific instructions. Number four, no doubt, just believe. Faith doesn't ignite with doubt. Like wood doesn't burn when it's entirely wet. Faith doesn't ignite with doubt. And number five, it's done for you and you will get it. It's done for you and you will get it. The world system believes when it receives. Faith in God believes then receives. Do you see the order? We looked at Hebrews eleven six 6 that says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We talked about some of the heroes in the Faith Hall of Fame and recognized that they moved, they received, they accomplished, overcame and lived great lives. How? All by using faith. In part two of Faith Moves, let's look at your faith design. Your faith design. This is a good place for us to drop in the biblical definition of faith. I'm sure you're already dialing in on the concept that faith is tied to your believing, but let's hear God's word on the matter. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A few things here. Faith is now. Did you notice that? Now faith. Faith is now. Faith is the substance, faith works hope, and faith has evidence. So if we thought faith was wishing upon a star, it's not even close. Faith has legislative ability. This, here's what I mean. That means it has the force of authority by virtue of God's word and his kingdom. Faith in God works because of your faith design. That's what we're going to look at here in this session. We're made in God's image. That's what Genesis says. We are made, created in God's image, and God is a word, faith, being. So we are also word, faith, beings made in his image. In the Old Testament, the famous patriarch Abraham found tremendous favor in God's eyes because he was a man who had faith, faith in God. He's called the father of faith, Abraham is, and he's honored for his trust in God's word, his trust in God's promises. Understand that there never would have been a promised land without first God's promise to Abraham. 
King David the psalmist was called a man after God's own heart because he was faithful to the Lord. In other words, David was a man after God's word, faith, being, his heart, his word, faith, being. So what was the outcome? David was faithful. Jeff Foxworthy, you know, the famous comedian and actor, he said this, my faith is important to me. Galatians 1.10, which is nobody else's favorite verse, but it's always been mine, says, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? He goes on to say, I just kind of figured if I live my life in such a way, and I'm not talking about performance like I don't drink and I don't smoke. He said, it's, am I kind? Do I see the people in need? Do I have grace with the people like grace has been extended to me? Mr. Foxworthy gets it. The outcome of faith is so that there can be many acts of grace. See, this is why faith is so critical to your faith design. You have a faith design. God starts everything with his word, his promise. Do you need a miracle? Do you need an answer? Maybe you need wisdom for a son or a daughter, a healing for your mom or your dad. God always starts the miracle with his word, with his promise. John 1 verse 1, look at this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God is a word faith being. It's how God does everything that we read about in Genesis 1. He speaks his word, and then he sees the outcome. Speaks the word, sees the outcome. Where does faith come in? We learn in part one that Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Hearing is useless if you ignore it, if you choose not to believe it, if you refuse to act on it and even scorn it like some do. Romans 1 talks about people without excuse who recognize God but refuse to honor God. What's the greatest dishonor that you can commit against God? It's to doubt him. The children of Israel were not allowed to enter the promised land on the first attempt because of an evil heart of, get this, unbelief, an evil heart of doubt. Look at Psalm 106, verse 24, talking about them. It says, then they despised the pleasant land, talking about the promised land. They despised the pleasant land. They did not believe God's word. See, God is quick and he's merciful to forgive our sins when we ask. But if you want to stay trapped and stuck outside of God's promises, just doubt his word. Choose not to believe him. Without faith, the Israelites weren't moving anywhere but back into the barren wilderness. They didn't believe God's word, his promise. You don't get the promised land if you don't believe the promise, period. So what happened the second time they approached the promised land with this whole new generation? Well, they decided to believe God's word. Were they better than their forefathers? Were they perfect and without sin? Of course not. They had learned that faith, faith in God was the key. Not their ability, not their strength, not their size, but faith in God. They learned faith moves. Yes, faith moves because faith pleases God. It works with his design, which is your design. It aligns with who he is. It aligns with who he designed you to be. Oh, you have to look at this verse that explains how faith pleases God. Look again at Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that God is and that he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Oh, wow. Let me ask you a question. To all you loving parents and all you loving grandparents, does it please you when your children are well, when they're safe, happy, blessed, when they're increasing in wisdom? It sure does. So just imagine God, the ultimate loving Heavenly Father, and how He finds great pleasure in seeing His children rewarded, blessed, getting answers, getting healed, getting help, promote it. As we just read in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it's impossible to please God without faith because he knows that faith moves. God knows faith works, faith moves, faith moves, answers, blessings, protection, provision, and a million other benefits from his hand into your life. He's a good father. You cannot, say this out loud, 
I cannot please God without faith. Why? Because faith moves. Faith moves the reward. God's rewards for your benefit. The rewards are for believing God's word, not for being Mr. or Miss Perfect, doing everything right. They're actually rewards for God's excellent performance. God performs for us and we get the rewards. Seeking God is the pursuit of going after his word, his reward of the promised land. That's having faith in God. You see, religion is actually quite the opposite. It's a form of pursuing God to tell him all the things that you've done and accomplished and performed. In Luke 18, there's a religious leader that Jesus said, he, it says, Jesus says he prayed with himself saying, God, I, I thank you that I'm, I'm not like these other guys, these other people, you know, they're extortioners and unjust adulterers and, and even that tax collector over there. Ugh, gross. After his arrogant prayer, Jesus said he went home unheard by God, unjustified, and stuck in his stinking life. You see, without faith, there's nowhere to go but down because faith moves. Faith moves up. Faith always moves up. Oh, Pastor Stephen, I, I just love the Lord. You know, I love the Lord. Well, that's great, but faith moves what you need into your life. Faith Pastor Stephen, I, I don't expect anything from the Lord. I, I just want to love and serve him. Again, without faith, it's impossible to please God. See, what you fail to see is the pride of religious arrogance in such a statement. To say, I don't expect anything from God, but he can expect everything from me. You see, I don't need his supply, but he probably needs my wonderful love. You see, that's just plain arrogant, right? When I say it like that, you can tell it stinks of pride. This would be to assume that all the blessings in your life are just somehow there, like your heartbeat. We've nothing to give God that he hasn't already blessed us with. The only thing that we can give God that he doesn't have is our expectation, our confidence in him. That's why faith pleases him. Faith comes by hearing his word, his promises, but then it's up to you to choose to believe him. You see, you can choose to doubt God. It's so easy to say we, we believe in the Lord, but then contradict ourselves with our actions that say we trust in our ability. We trust in our money, in a job or a position or our talents or our education or our strength. And the list goes on and on and on. Chris Rock, the famous comedian and actor, he said, Americans worship money and we all go to the same church, the church of ATM. Everywhere you look, there's a new branch popping up reminding you about how much money you got and how much money you don't got. And if you got less than $20, the machine won't even talk to you. The machine is like, you better go see the teller. <laughs> but that's not you. That's not us, right? No, no, no. We worship God, not money or stuff. Unfortunately, I've heard some people say, well, well, maybe God wants to do more for one person than another person. Maybe that's just the way it is. Well, is that the way you think? Does, does God do more for some people while he deprives um, others based on the random wheel of chance? God is good all of the time, my friend, all of the time. The Bible says specifically that he is no respecter of persons. He knows all our design because he's our maker, our creator, our wonderful designer. He likes our design because it's made in his image, but he also knows it runs on faith. We are like him, faith beings. Romans 2 verse 11 for there is no partiality with God. Say that. There's no partiality with God. Other translations say no respect of persons. In other words, God doesn't regard people's net worth, their accomplishments, their background, talents, age, or nationality. God doesn't regard how tall or strong you are. He looks for one thing, faith. Faith in God. His goodness and his mercy endure forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging, and yet he's able to change everything. God's not random, but infinitely precise. Precise with his ability to create, and precise with his ability to save, to redeem, and to bless. Think of this. Four times the Bible says, the just shall live by faith. Well, what a shock. Faith beings shall live by faith. 
You see, it's only a shock if you disregard your maker's word. When we disregard God, we end up disregarding the essential element of our own design. We are meant to live by faith. Therefore, we die on the drip of unbelief. What did the children of Israel die of in the wilderness? Was it, was it because of sin? No, it was unbelief that had them stuck. Hear it again, down in your spirit. Faith moves. Faith moves. God loves you. He cares for you. God sent his son to save you, free you from the curse, to heal, help, promote, and empower you. But faith is the key. Faith moves. Faith moves all these blessings into your life. Yes, faith moves because it's a force that connects your word faith being with God's being. Let me give you a Jesus story about a woman desperately needing healing. In Mark 5, Jesus is on his way to a man's house named Jairus to heal his daughter. Along the way, he has a faith interruption. A faith interruption? Yes, a faith interruption. Check this out. Jesus is walking along with Jairus and a huge crowd is following. They're pressing tightly all around him, all on every side. And there's like all along the way, there's this, this, this shoving and pushing. And along the way, a woman who's had a flow of blood for 12 years pushes through the crowd. The Bible says she's endured much suffering, spent all that she's had on doctors and is only worse off even sicker. She's anemic now. She hears about Jesus. Look what the Bible says about her faith. Mark 5, 28. For she kept saying, if I only touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. She kept saying what she kept believing. If I touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. So this precious Jewish lady does what no other would dare. She, she pushes through the crowd, suffering from the sickness. In her culture, you were not allowed to come near others with any active flow of blood. She was considered unclean. Here's the thing you must remember. Real faith moves. It moves you. It moves you and it moves miracles to you. Faith is a mover and a shaker, my friend. She comes up behind Jesus, presses through the crowd and just touches his garment. And immediately the word says, yes, immediately she's healed from her distressing condition, healed. But then suddenly Jesus stops and it says he recognized that power had gone forth from him. He turns around and he says, who, who touched me? What? The disciples are like, are you kidding, Jesus? Who touched you? Everybody's pushing and shoving, and you want to know who touched you? Jesus remains still. He looks around to find the woman who touched him. She was frightened, scared, because she knew the cultural law forbid her from even being there. Still, she also knew that she was miraculously healed. She proceeded to tell Jesus all the truth, her whole story, while everybody listens. Here's Jesus' response in Mark 5, verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has restored you to health. Go in peace and be continually healed and freed from your distressing bodily disease. Jesus said, your faith, your faith has restored you. Some translations say, your faith has made you whole. Think of this. A huge crowd is pushing and shoving against Jesus. Possibly some folks are even colliding and pressing up against the Lord. You probably know what it's like to be in a large sporting event or a concert. And as the crowd is making its way through the narrow corridors into the arena, it can get really congested. And that's just with people trying to get to their seat. Well, these are people that are anxious. They're desperate for a life-changing miracle. There's probably many of them needing healing. Many of them are needing to be cured of debilitating conditions. Many of them are already touching Jesus just because of the crowd. But, and here's the difference. Here's where many people slip into this random idea of God's willingness to bless, heal, help, or deliver. The woman's faith touches Jesus supernaturally. As we know, She's a word faith being. Her faith reaches out and touches the person of God, the word faith being of God. Jesus called her daughter. A daughter reached out to the Father, God the Father, 
through Jesus, the Son. Your faith connects with God's goodness, God's promises, God's love. She tapped the power of God's being with faith. Faith moves God's power into your life, into your body needing a healing, into your business needing provision, into your cornfields needing growing, into your mind needing peace. What was the evidence of her faith? Because you see, faith has evidence. Mark 5, 28 says, she kept saying, if I touch his garment, I shall be restored. Ah, she kept saying. Saying what? Words, words that expressed her faith from a faith being. Her words were representative of her faith. Remember, Jesus said her faith made her whole. Jesus never said, you know, I only want to heal one person here today. So, so you over there, today's your lucky day. God's only got enough miracle dust for one person. And lady, you won the lottery. No, a million times no. That's not how it works. Jesus said her faith made her whole. Now, we know from reading Mark 11 in part one of this series that true faith is faith in God. It's the God kind of faith. That's the stuff that moves mountains. But as we learn in Mark 11, 23, it says, Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. This precious lady was working the force of faith, you see. We know she kept saying over and over and over and over, aiming her trust and reliance on God. God wants just as much for you to get supernatural outcomes in your life also. He doesn't love that woman more than he loves you. Romans 2, 11, we just read, it told us there's no partiality with God. Well, Stephen, God doesn't do things like he used to. Oh, so you're telling me God's a liar? When he said he was the same yesterday, today, and forever, he was lying? No, I know you're not saying that, but don't for a second allow a slight tolerance for that kind of variation in God's character. God cannot lie. God does not lie. So now, we know one thing for sure. Whatever we do, it's got to be by faith or forget about it, right? Is God holding out on you? No. He's a word, faith, being, and all who come before him must come in faith. There's no other way. It's because the just shall live by faith faith. God's kingdom is a faith kingdom. His word is a faith word. God is a faith God. That's why faith moves. So if faith moves God's hand, can we conclude unbelief stops God's hand? That's a good question. Often religion says if things are stuck, it must be God's will. God's trying to teach you something by leaving you stuck in the mud. Hmm. That sure doesn't sound good, does it? So let's take a look from God's words, from his perspective, if there's no faith. What's it look like? If God were to show up and want to help people and bless them, can he do that when there's no faith? I mean, surely if Jesus walked into the room, he could do anything regardless of what people believed or didn't believe, right? Look at when Jesus went back to his hometown of Nazareth with the desire to help those people. Mark 6, verses 5 and 6. And he was not able to do even one work of power there. And he marveled because of their unbelief, their lack of faith in him. And he went about among the surrounding villages and continued teaching. To doubt God is to disable God in your life. James 1, 7 says that a person who doubts God shouldn't even imagine that he will receive anything he asks for from the Lord. It's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to guess about the outcome here. To doubt God is to disable God in your life. It doesn't mean he stops being. He can't do that. God can't deny himself, but we can choose to deny our faith design by denying him. Now, before you think that God's somehow running a shallow bartering system where you give him an ounce of faith and he gives you an ounce of a miracle, let's allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth here. Romans 4, verse 16. I love this. Therefore, inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given as an act 
of grace, unmerited favor, to make it stable and valid and guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the devotees and the inheritors of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is thus the father of us all, in order that it might be given as an act of grace. That means to be given what we can't or don't deserve. It's undeserved favor, blessing, and gifts. Oh my, this is absolutely amazing. It's beautiful. God's determined that inheriting his goodness, his promises for healing and blessing are to be an outcome of faith so that we don't have to deserve it, earn it, suffer for it, pay for it. In fact, God goes on to say that faith is what makes it stable, valid, guaranteed to those who share the faith of Abraham. Well, Galatians 3.29 says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. That means you have a faith design in God's image. Abraham took God at his word, and God basically said, finally, someone's believing my word, my promises. All the pieces are coming together. I love how Romans 4.16 clearly says, faith has outcome. Faith moves, and that means outcome, a stable, valid, guaranteed outcome that's an act of grace. I don't know about you, but if, if I felt like I had to deserve or earn God's promises and answers to my prayers, I probably wouldn't even pray. How could I believe for an outcome? I don't deserve God's goodness. I can't deserve God's goodness in myself. I'm not perfect or good enough in me. Oh, but having faith in Christ, I believe on and I have great confidence in his goodness. In Christ, you and I are Abraham's seed. Your faith design connects to God the Father through Jesus the Son. Let me quote it to you again. Inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given to you as an act of grace. Go ahead. Praise God for that. This is why it's so, so important to understand faith moves. You're not struggling and failing because God doesn't think you're perfect. It's not because God doesn't want to help you or answer you. You're not fighting hopelessness and depression because God's forsaken you or not willing to forgive you. It's faith. It's a faith problem. It's your faith design. Faith in God produces the outcome of grace. God is the word faith being that created everything and his language is faith. Stop being religious. Turn God's way. Believe you receive because faith moves your faith design. Pray this after me. God, you created me in your image. My design is for a life of faith. I believe you sent Jesus. He's your only begotten son, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He died on the cross for me. You raised him up from the grave. Forgive me now of all my sins. I put my faith in you. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to live for you. All in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.